Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope the week's gone well. It's certainly gone fast, hasn't it? Uh, just to remind you about the Maputo conference uh, that the IMF is hosting on May 29 and May 30 uh, in Maputo. Looking forward to uh, being a facilitator at that and uh, eating some of those wonderful tiger prawns they have down there. I wrote that piece of Matters United Kingdom and the scramble for Crimea and I was referring to the fact that London's booming and I was saying that I think London and by extension the United Kingdom is a little bit like Dubai. Both cities have become safe havens in an uncertain world. On that note I'll put up a photograph of the moon over Shepherd's Bush. I've gone to do some shopping at Westfield which is really a tremendous uh, shopping mall and I was walking back to my friend Alex's house and I took the photograph of the moon and another one when I first arrived in London uh, on the 15th, it's about 7 a.m. and I'm looking back from Putney Bridge towards the city over the Thames. Uh, and once again I'd like to thank uh, Beatrice uh, of CNBC for the interview we did earlier this week. Home Thoughts returned to Rumi because someone tweeted me early in the morning um, a Rumi quote, and my favourite remains, we come spinning out of nothingness scattering stars like dust. And I like this one too, sit, be still and listen because you're drunk and we're at the edge of the roof. When you go to the Mevlana's mausoleum in Konya, as you enter, the following is written, come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshipper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times. Come yet again. Come, come. And I put up a photograph of Konya and really had this most extraordinary experience where I was completely intoxicated. I watched a summer as well. Um, and it was a full moon outside. And when we came out, when we came out, because we, we watched the summer a little bit in the, in the basement, my goodness. As if I drunk the finest champagne. Um, I, I, and finally, I'll put up the history of the universe from Wired because, of course, of this tremendous uh, discovery we've had uh, this week, which confirms what actually Alan Guth um, predicted with his string theory. Political reflections US prepares to gas Russia into submission. 76% of Russia's natural gas exports are bound for Europe, the bulk of it to Germany, Italy, France, and the United Kingdom. Russia's weight in the world is largely derived not from its economically burdensome nuclear arsenal, but as an energy giant. The US sets the stage for a protracted assault on Russia's energy trade, which accounts for more than half of Moscow's federal expenditures. Thanks to shale fracking, the United States recently surpassed Russia as the world's number one exporter of natural gas and will next year become the top oil producer. As the New York Times reported on March the 5th, the administration's strategy is to move aggressively to deploy the advantages of its new resources to undercut Russian natural gas sales to Ukraine and Europe. That's not the half of it. My conclusions are this fellow has a point. Fracking is a geopolitical game changer and the US has not even begun to swing the bat yet. So very interesting point and I agree with it. And then I like this article in Business Meet Week. What chess players could teach Obama about handling Putin? As I've said for years, it is a waste of time to attempt to discern deep strategy in Mr. Putin's actions, Kasparov wrote in a column in the Wall Street Journal this month. There are no complex national interests in a dictator's calculations. There are only personal interests, the interests of those close to him who keep him in power and how best to consolidate that power. So what to do? If the West punishes Russia with sanctions and a trade war, Kasparov wrote, that might be effective eventually but it would also be cruel to the 140 million Russians who live under Mr. Putin's rule. And it would be unnecessary. 
instead sanctioned the 140 oligarchs who will dump Mr. Putin in the trash tomorrow if he cannot protect their assets abroad, target their visas, their mansions, and IPOs in London, their yachts and Swiss bank accounts. Use banks, not tanks. Obama is doing pretty much what the Grand Master advises. This week, the White House announced sanctions on seven top Russian government officials and four others from Ukraine. The moves were made in concert with the 28-member European Union, which imposed its own set of penalties. The US also included a ban on travel visas. I conclude with the, con with the final paragraph in this particular article. Obama is correct that in the broad scheme of things, life is not chess. The US has no interest in putting Russia in checkmate. The two nations would be, be much better off as partners. In chess, it's perfectly acceptable to sacrifice all your pawns, knights, bishops, and rooks if that's what it takes to pin down the opponent's kink. Not in the real world, so Obama is correctly opening exit doors. If Putin steps back, Russia will, will be rewarded. For Obama, the trick is to play the diplomatic chess game like a grandmaster while seeing the opportunity for moves that benefit both sides of the board. And I agree with that article. And further conclusions, I think the Crimea precedent is surely worrisome for China, where a number of the periphery countries would surely choose, choose to peel off. And anyway, I thought the president was pivoting to Asia anyway. On that note, I'll put up a photograph of President Obama and President Putin that I found, and also then take you to Pepe Escobar, who's always tongue-in-cheek, but he's saying this about Russian sanctions as war and farce. Moscow is playing it cool because it may choose among a staggering array of counter-punches. It enjoys the support of the BRICS group of emerging powers, the non-aligned movement, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Composing with the U.S., Moscow agreed to impose sanctions on Iran and is a key, key player in the P5 plus 1 nuclear negotiations. If the sanction comedy goes on, Moscow, Moscow has already announced it will play hardball with the P5 plus 1, will cease to sanction Iran and may even finally weaponize Tehran with jewels of the S-400 variety. Moscow, the number one oil and gas export on the planet, can also play further hardball with Europe's dependency on Gazprom, clinically target U.S. companies working in Russia, speed up the BRICS-coordinated escape from the U.S. dollar, as in a new international payment system in a basket of currencies for the BRICS, as well as other emerging markets, and even activate the ultimate economic nuclear bomb which is to accept payment for Russian oil and gas in ruble, one euros or gold, thus delivering a terminal blow to the petrodollar. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will be the end of the comedy hour, says Pepe. Turkey has blocked access to Twitter. Uh, users reported on Friday they were forwarded from Twitter.com to a statement from Turkey's telecom regulator, TIB, which cited court orders for the site's apparent closure. The state-run Anatolian news agency said authorities technically blocked access to Twitter because the service had ignored the orders to remove some links deemed illegal. Twitter said it was investigating. Erdogan on Thursday promised to root out and wipe out Twitter services, which he said has helped his political enemies conduct a smear campaign against him. The international community can say this, can say that, I don't care at all. Everyone will see how powerful the Republic of Turkey is, he said. Um, and uh, clearly his woes continue. Uh, the M7, MH370 search continues. I'll put up a, the latest diagram I've received about it. It really is extremely sad, perplexing and alarming. The Euro 137.82, remember we were above 139 prior to Yellen comments, dollar index 80.17. Now this is pressing against key resistance levels. If we can punch through here, we've got, we've got another leg higher coming. Japanese Yen 102.38, the Swiss E 0.8834, the pound 165.08, that's the best performing developing market currency over the last 12 months. 
Um, the uh, Aussie 0.9057, interestingly, notwithstanding the weak data coming out of China, that's holding above 0.90, which is important. India rupee 61.11, South Korean one 1182.45. The real 232.64, the Egyptian pound 696.26, and the rand 1090 gradually grinding towards that 11 level. Dollar index, uh, I'll put up a three month chart. We're now at key resistance levels at this level of 80.17. Euro dollar, um, I still have that stop at 133.80. I'm going to keep an eye on it. I think it goes back to 140 eventually, but 137.82 last dollar yen, 102.38. Russian stocks traded in New York fell the most in two weeks uh, in the aftermath of President Barack Obama's decision to impose further financial sanctions on a wider, wider swathe of Russian officials. Um, various names have come up. GDP in Russia slowed to 1.3% last year, which was the weakest pace since a contraction in 2009. Um, the economy was showing signs of crisis, apparently, according to a comment on March 17 by the Deputy Economy, Economy Minister. S&P lowered Russia's growth forecast to 1.2% this year. The geopolitical tensions have sent the benchmark MISEX index into a bear market, dropping 12% this year. Um, capital outflows from Russia have increased 60% this year to $45 billion from the first quarter of last year. So, I mean, plenty of negative news, but look at this. It is... The MySex is the cheapest among 21 developing countries monitored by Bloomberg, trading at 4.8 times estimated earnings. I therefore see it as a buy, and I'm continuing to buy it on retracements. Um, there is one school of thought that the sanctions were going to get stronger and stronger, and it's going to squeeze the Russian economy, but on balance, I think that's all in the price. I'll put up uh, a link to the FT for the MySex chart. It's 6.48% above its 52-week low of 1240.18, set on March 17. That's the key level. I'm looking to buy it nearer there if I can. Gold, I'll put up a three-month chart of that. 1331.47 were considerably lower than the highs of 2014. I think we'll go lower still. Crude, I'll put up a three-month chart of that. $98.37, expensive above 100, headed to 90 in my opinion. Copper, I'm going to put up a one-year chart of that. And just look at that one-year chart and you'll see where copper goes, so does Zambia. Hermes posted a record 2013 profit, mar uh, profit um, uh, as demand stays high. 8.9% increase in 2013 earnings at the maker of Birkin bags. Um, and there is a slowdown in luxury goods consumption. But, you know, Hermes is the ultra, ultra high net worth product. And that continues to outperform all of the other Thursday, Taliban attack on the Serena Hotel in Kabul. Nine people, including four foreigners, were killed in the Taliban attack on a luxury hotel in Kabul on Thursday. Deputy Interior Minister General Mohammad Ayub Salangi on Friday released details on the fatalities following the attack on the Serena Hotel, the most prestigious accommodation in Kabul. Uh, two men, Afghan men, two women and one child died. Foreigners, including two women and two men. The attackers had pretended to be guests, hid small pistols in their socks, and penetrated several layers of security. The Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack. The four young attackers entered the hotel at about 6 p.m., pretending to be guests, and started to attack at 9 p.m. Two guards have been taken to hospital, as well as one foreign national employee of the hotel. All four attackers were gunned down, two of them after they resisted in a bathroom in the hotel. Um, and I extend my deepest condolences. And, uh, one has to be concerned about what's going to happen in Kabul when the U.S. exits, which seems what's about to happen. Sub-Saharan Africa, the curious tale of the world-beating Somali shilling. Here's a pecuniary peculiarity to rival Bitcoin. The world's strongest currency over the past 12 months belongs to Somalia, which has no foreign currency reserves or any discernible monetary policy. Yet the Somali shilling has overcome such disadvantages to appreciate against the dollar by just under 60% since March last year, becoming the strongest among 175 global currencies tracked by Bloomberg. Its surge has been so pronounced that the second most robust currency of the same period, the Icelandic krona, <coughs> could only manage a measly 10.2% rise. 
what lies behind the shilling's gravity-defying performance, indeed. Um, and there's a, a theory there, but I think it's quite extraordinary. Um, and and the, the central bank was only re-established in 2011, and it shows you the kinds of price moves you can get out of the frontier, overshooting to the upside and the downside, as it were. South African all share is uh, plus 1.2% in 2014. Dollar versus Rand, I'll put up a three month chart, ticking higher, going back towards the 11 level. Egyptian pound, you've got a very steady hand there, the GCC folks, ex Qatar. Egyptian stock market up now 25.59% this year, which is Africa's best. And I wrote about this a while back and in January when I said, you know, if the equity markets had a vote in Egypt, Army Chief General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi would actually get one of those impossible-to-believe votes of 99.8%. I said that on the 20th of January 2014. I'll put up a photograph of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. The Nigerian all share remains under pressure, down 9.42%. I've been talking about the drip drip of bad news. Another report came out that well over 500 people were killed in Nigeria last week when security forces responded to what the military portrayed as a jailbreak attempt by the Islamist group Boko Haram. Well over 500 people were killed in Nigeria last week when security forces responded to what the military portrayed as a jailbreak attempt by the Islamist group Boko Haram, making it one of the bloodiest episodes yet in the military's five-year counterinsurgency campaign, according to officials in the northern town of Maiduguri. As inmates streamed last Friday through the open gates of Giwa Barracks, a notorious military detention center in Maiduguri, a military plane fired on them while soldiers on the ground also opened fire, killing scores, a senior hospital official said in Maiduguri. The aircraft opened fire from the sky. The aircraft picked them easily from up top. Other officials in Madaguri corroborated, corroborated his account and went further, asserting that the overwhelming majority of those killed were detainees, imprisoned on flimsy or no charges, and not even proven insurgents as claimed by the military. They managed to eliminate those who were in detention, said Mr. Zana. The whole episode is to kill the inmates, that's all. The Ghana stock exchange is up 11.26% in 2014, but a great deal of that has been eroded by the very weak SEDI. The IMF and World Bank have raised the red flag over Kenya's debt. This is an article in the Business Daily. Kenya must put a tight lid on its debt load to keep its economy on a steady growth path. The IMF and the World Bank have warned in a note to key organs that determine their lending to member states. East Africa's largest economy risks rapid debt escalation when planned borrowing for the mega projects in the pipeline are taken into account, raising the red flag for the very first time on the dangers to growth that is looming from Jubilee government's leveraged infrastructure development plan. A more detailed discussion of the costing of programs and projects envisaged under the second medium-term plan MTP-2 would be warranted in order to better assess their potential impact on debt sustainability, the lenders say. Um, the IMF WB joint note proposes that Kenya finds new mechanisms of funding its huge infrastructure projects that is devoid of debt as envisaged, as envisaged by the MTP2. Uh, explore innovative funding mechanisms, including pri public-private partnerships, and assesses how any new programs and projects will be incorporated into the government's medium-term expenditure framework. Macroeconomic policies should cement recent successes by, among other things, aiming at gradually lowering the public debt-to-GDP ratio while raising infrastructure investment. And um, uh, basically, it looks pretty hard-hitting point of fact and I think it's right and actually I think that's what the message that Christine Lagarde delivered in Mombasa in January in her very velvet wrapped manner the president that evening was fulsome in his speech uh, about her saying he noted her legendary interest in roses your schedule may not allow you an opportunity for scuba diving she was a synchronized swimmer Madame MD, your style has won your accolades among your peers and IMF member states. Calm, cool, persistent. We add inclusive and considerate. With calm heads and partners like yourself, we need to take unconventional decisions to fuel prosperity for our people. 
I'll put up a photograph of the President at Madame Lagarde at State Lodge in Mombasa. Then I'll put up a link to the MindSpeak session uh, with Vimal, who co-hosted it with me, um, and the one with Lagarde and a photograph of, uh, of her at MindSpeak. And I wrote about this on the 10th of March. Uhuru's salary cut good but more needed, I said. Um, I was reading an article in the venerable Wall Street Journal about currency weakness in Africa, and I quote, I command the resurrection of the SETI in the name of Jesus, preached evangelist Nicholas Duncan Williams of a mega church called Action Chapel recently. Then he addressed Satan, take your hands off the central bank. In Ghana, the SETI lost 11% against the dollar in the first two months of 2014. Some radio personalities blame the free fall on the devil, these dwarves, the black magic is what has made the city lose value, said Anita D'Souza. The article concluded, this is the Wall Street Journal, compounding these pressures from afar is a problem of Africa's own making big budget deficits. And I said the Ghana city has been in free fall for a while. Zambia's crutch is at a record low. The South African rand has fallen over 20%. Interestingly, the Kenya shilling has outperformed its African peer as a point of fact. And I said the Achilles heel of the African resurgence is the recurrent expenditure component of their budgets. African governments are beginning to load their balance sheets. The train wreck risk, whilst a residual one, might grow because I've yet to see or meet an African politician who's prepared to take a scalpel to the cost of delivering government in Africa. Then on Friday I learned the President and his deputy would take a 20% pay cut while members of his cabinet would take a 10% uh, pay cut with immediate effect um, and I think that was a good a signal through the noise that the president sent uh, who also said you know uh, just Kenya's, Kenya is spending close to 4.6 billion dollars in salaries leaving only 2.3 billion for development and my point is that's pretty that's nothing compared to the plans Kenya has and I think that's the dichotomy that the IMF and World Bank have picked up on. And uh, I think the president's right. The question is, you know, what kind of follow through are we going to see? Kenyan police failed to realize that a car they impounded from a Somali man and stored outside their anti terror unit offices for a week was packed full of explosives already attached to a Nokia detonator. Telegraph. Kenyan police failed to realize uh, that it was already attached to a Nokia detonator, the blue turret, a four wheel drive. My dad said he saw it because he's coming up today. We we're talking about it just parked outside there was only thoroughly checked when foreign counter-terror officers believed to be from the FBI saw the vehicle and recognized it was on an international alert list. Six separate pipe bombs made up of a total of 130 pounds of plastic explosive were wielded into the vehicle's rear seats enough to collapse a multi-story building according to Kenyan police. An AK-47, 250 rounds of ammunition, detonators, grenades were also found when a full search was eventually carried out and completed on Tuesday. The vehicle was impounded in Mombasa on March 11, and the driver, Somali, and his passenger, Kenyan, of Somali origin, were arrested and charged with illegally importing a vehicle. My conclusions are asymmetric risks remain potent. On that note, I'll put up the photograph of Westgate that I took that day when it was on fire. Richard Leakey says that the Kenya Wildlife Service has been infiltrated by powerful people enriching themselves off poaching. This was a very hard-hitting press conference um, held yesterday. I call on him now personally to take the next step and get this under control. It's not an impossible task. I think the right leadership, the right management can get it under control within six months, referring to poaching. Nation media reports full year profit before tax increased 2.4%. Revenue was up 8.3%. Profit before tax up 2.4%. And the thing that caught my attention, it was actually expanding 7.507% at the first half stage. There's been a significant step down. I missed the briefing, I'm afraid. Profit after tax was up less than 1% at 0.9122%. And whereas it was running at plus 23.989% at the first half stage, earnings per share up 0.75%. They're sitting on a pile of cash, 4.097 billion shillings, nearly $50 million in point of fact. Final dividend uh, was uh, 750 a share, but bear in mind that everyone got a bonus share last year, so it's been an increase of a, a pay in payout of about 20%. 
Company commentary, the performance was tempered by the temporary business interruptions of the regional subsidiary companies. Challenges were also experienced with delayed payments resulting in high provision for bad and doubtful debts. But according to another report I saw, they thought um, that they would recover that. Further commentary via Business Daily, the Kiswahili TV channel QTV, revenue expanded 117%, um, operating profit up 54%. Business Daily posted a 51% rise in operating profit. One Ancient Communications, the Tanzanian arm, grew by 29%. Advertising on the nation grew 12%. Investing heavily in the digital division, since we know it is the next frontier, said Mr. Gitahangi. Um, but my conclusions are there was a significant step down in the full year versus the first half. I expect the price to trade lower today on that news. Um, um, profit before tax, as I said, up 2.4% versus 17.507%. Uh, and uh, but they've got a lot of cash on hand. I think you know people will look for that final dividend, um, so it'll stabilise. But you know I think it's undershot expectations. Nairobi all shares up 6.25% this year, and just 0 0.07 of a point off a record. NSE 20 up 0.45% in 2014. Safaricom, which is up 15.297% this year. Close to record 1250 yesterday, as did Co op Bank, which is up 15.49% uh, this year. EGAD set a fresh 52 week high at 3050, that's up 28.42%. That's following the blistering rally in coffee futures. Nation Media eased 0.808% after the release of those full year results. I think it's going to go lower today. Safaricom rallied 1.626% yesterday to close at a fresh record of 1250. It's last trading at 1260. Um, when I checked on the screen, I'll put up a photograph of the man of the moment, Bob Collymore. Kenya Airways has had a strong rally over the last five sessions, up 10.04%. I think there's still further to go. Scan Group, big trade went through there, 942,200 shares. I don't think people have factored in the WPP network effect. Court Bank closed at a record high, trading lower today. KCB uh, has rallied more than 6% since releasing its full year earnings. Um, and uh, compared to that, Equity Bank had retreated 8.088% this week, but it's bouncing today. Jubilee Insurance retreated yesterday after their release, uh, 3.4375. I think it can, really, it, it can uh, uh, retreat a bit more. They have a strong balance sheet, but I sense the competitor landscape looks a lot less benign. EABL was up 1.57 yesterday. Percent East African Portland rallied to a close at 100, up 2.56 percent. That's rallied 44.92 percent this year, which is pretty remarkable. And Samir finally up 34.95 percent this year as well. Once again, thank you for stopping by. Wishing you a tremendous weekend.